warm welcome to the and my warm welcome to the dis distinguished chief guest of day uh, dr r uh, prasanna kumar uh, and you uh, know thanks to the coordinators for organizing such a wonderful um, uh, sctp program because uh, there are many updates that's happening uh, in the field of computer science every day so to meet with you uh, know uh, the students has to explore all the technologies uh, that is developed and to uh, name a few uh, things or you no know, quantum computing cloud computing iot blockchain machine learning artificial intelligence and you know uh, related uh, informations are growing up so uh, this is a wonderful uh, you know opportunity for the students to learn uh, all the uh, technologies uh, that is getting updated every day and um, as for the um, objectives concerned uh, the first day uh, the students may understand what the quantum computing is all about and uh, you know how is it different from the uh, regular computing and how the processor or, or how the mechanism is being handled and how it has been applicable uh, in the nlp and uh, the second day talks about uh, the role of iot in uh, sustainable development because uh, everywhere whatever we see it is an iot nowadays so when we go for an industry it is iot when you from come for a nano a home automation again it is an iot uh, when you come for any manufacturing industry if again it is going to be an iot uh, even the medical pharma anything any um, any development that is happening it is through uh, iot so the student has to get definitely explored on the uh, iot concept that will be handled in day 2 and uh, day 3 talks about the blockchain and the cryptocurrency technologies sir. um no you might be aware that the uh, government of india has also uh, uh, planned to adopt the uh, digital currencies and you know uh, blockchain technology is going to uh, take away the uh, rule the world so uh, it's very important that the student should also get explored with uh, blockchain technologies and of course we know uh, it's an era of ai ml and data science so every student has to get explored with the machine learning technologies and the related security and uh, access management technology because uh, you no know, uh, at the same time the technology is growing uh, the security is also a big question mark that also needs to be uh, addressed i think uh, it's a wonderful way of um, making the things and the thanks to all the coordinators that uh, uh, you have uh, garlanded it in such a way uh, that the student starts with quantum computing and ends with the uh, security for asset management so uh, please all the participants uh, make use of this uh, workshop and get to know uh, more about these technologies and uh, it's very very important for your career too okay so with this new words uh, i welcome uh, dr r prasanna kumar for uh, today's event and uh, thanks for the coordinators for giving me this opportunity welcome you all ஒருத்தனுக்கேன்ஸ்ட்ரோடிங்ஸ்ட்ரோடிங்ஸ்ட்ரோடிங்ஸ்ட்ரோடிங்ஸ்ட்ரோடிங்ஸ்ட்ர
Yeah, I hope I am audible and my screen is also visible, right? Can someone? Yes, uh, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. So the topic for uh, today that I have uh, opted for is quantum computing for uh, NLP. So uh, today we talk about AI in all walks of time, uh, life. So AI, healthcare. AI in business, AI in transportation, AI in smart cities. So artificial is artificial intelligence is the key which is driving this world today. Coming to the subset of AI, which uh, we can call it as NLP. So it deals with the interaction between human language and computers. So we can call NLP as a branch of AI that deals with the interaction between human and computers. So it is a field that has been growing rapidly over the past decade maybe and it has become an essential part of our daily lives. From the virtual assistants like bots on our phones to the recommender systems we use to make purchase decisions, NLP is a key. NLP actually is an interdisciplinary field that draws on techniques from computer science, linguistics, mathematics, and psychology. We can include more departments also. It's a complex field that involves several subdomains such as syntactic and semantic analysis. Of course, uh, we can talk about sentiment analysis, language modeling, machine translation, etc. These are just a few words to, to share with you. Now let's just go into the agenda of this particular talk. So I have uh, split this entire session into four. One, I'll be just introducing the basic concepts of NLP, not much, maybe a bird's eye view. And then let me just introduce something about fandom computing, what it is all about. And we'll go into our topic that is QNLP, that is quantum computing for NLP. And at the end, I would like to introduce few tools to you in QNLP. There are n number of open source tools and proprietary tools available already in the market for QNLP. So I'll just introduce one or two to you. Coming to what is NLP. So it actually helps machine process and understand the human language. So can you give me an example it's to the audience. Can you give me an example where we use NLP in our day to day life? Let's be my, my, interactive. Uh, since if it is um, offline, how it will be there, uh, we'll go by the same way. Can you just tell me where we use NLP in our day to day life? Okay, I'll just rephrase the question. Can you tell me a few tools that you use daily which uses NLP? Maybe like uh, from Amazon, we use Alexa, Google Assist, and we have Siri, of course. See, these are voice recognition systems which basically understands the commands that we give to the system. So the fundamental goal of NLP is to enable computers to understand whatever we say, interpret, and generate natural language in the same way as we human beings do. Of course, this involves developing algorithms, models. Those models can analyze and make sense of large volume of text data, recognize the patterns, and identify relationships between different concepts and entities. So NLP, in short, we can say that it will process the information contained in natural language as text. So how a, an NLP is related with Siri or how it is uh, related with uh, Google Assist, etc. See, whatever information we give or whatever command we give in our natural language through audio or to, through text, Actually, the system recognizes that and tries to interpret what we are saying and then it implements certain things that we do. 
So maybe I can call it as uh, the engineering goal of NLP is to develop practical applications and technologies that can be used in real world scenarios. Another classic example is our chat GPT, which is the talk of this entire world today. So NLP is uh, mostly used in applications that involves high level of interaction required between human beings and computers with unstructured data. So for NLP, it actually involves designing and implementing algorithms, models that can be used to solve specific problems. So here a problem is nothing but I can call um, a language translation, speech recognition, text classification, etc. So this NLP is also called as computational linguistics. Maybe I can uh, abbreviate that to CL, uh, or we can call it as human language te technology, HLT. See, this NLP involves developing user interfaces. That's very important. Also, it involves some software components, which will enable the user to interact with NLP-based systems in a seamless manner. So I can call like the ultimate goal of NLP is to create systems that can understand and process natural language in a way that is indistinguishable from human level performance. Like it will act as we are just interacting with a human being. So this involves advancing the state of art in NLP research and development and integrating these advances into practical applications. So these practical applications can improve the way we communicate and interact with, of course, the computers. So coming to the next point, I would like to introduce about, uh, maybe just I have to skip this, uh, the basic components of NLP. So as a superset NLP, it has uh, some subsets like NLU and NLG. NLU is nothing but natural language understanding and NLG stands for natural language generation. Now let me explain these two components in detail since we have discussed about NLP. This NLU, that is natural language understanding, is used to understand the human language by extracting the key elements. So the key elements here refers to the syntax, context, intent, feeling of the sentence, etc. NLU takes the unstructured text, as I told you, unstructured text, and it converts it into a structured format. So the machine will be easily uh, in a position to understand data that is in the structured format. So example for NLU, we can have like chatbots. So in a chatbot, the system or the computer actually understands the questions asked by the human being or the user. and it replies to us either by a text message or by voice messages. So an example for NLU is a simple chatbot. Now let's go for NLG, natural language generation. So it is somewhat a complex task. So this NLG is used to generate as the word suggests, or it, it will actually create meaningful text that is understandable by human beings. That's very important. So the output will be in a structured form, actually, from this NLG, NLG whatever tool we are using. So example, we can call uh, summarization, text summarization as a, a classic example where we have abstractive and extractive summarizations. And we can say automated journalism. So automated journalism is nothing but news articles are generated by computers without human intervention. So this is a old example. Of course, uh, if we use chat GPT, everything can be generated, right, including our code. So these are the main components that is NLU and NLG are the main components of NLP. We'll move on to the next thing, applications, where NLP is used. Already I have given some introduction about applications in terms of real world. So you can see I have not uh, put the entire applications of NLP, but uh, I have picked few of the most important applications of uh, NLP that is in use today. 
the applications are far reaching and varied actually ranging from language translation chatbots virtual assistants uh sentiment analysis speech recognition of course and uh, summarization as i told you so coming to this let me just start from the first one on the top of uh, the slide that is text mining and information retrieval so this text mining and information retrieval actually nlp can be used uh, to extract useful information we all know that uh, what is information what is data etc so we can use this for extracting useful information from large volume of text data that's very important we have huge ab abundant corpus available from where we can extract something useful so what are the applications where we can go for this uh, information extracting in what domains so we can go for extracting information from medical records from scientific publications of course everyone um, particularly in the faculty uh, community we talk about publications we publish a lot of papers every day every day in the sense uh, uh, some of our colleagues or someone in the world publishes n number of articles daily so we can extract some useful information over uh, this and of course medical records it provides ample opportunity in the healthcare sector um, to extract information for effective uh, disease identification and of course uh, people are using to identify the potential drug targets for a particular uh, patient and uh, they they use it for uh, finding the mutations particularly like uh, disease causing mutations by using the old medical records that are available in an unstructured format i am coming towards the right uh, we have the second one uh, maybe uh, the named entity recognition ner so actually it is one among the applications of nlp it involves automatically identifying and classifying named entities in text so which is a very interesting uh, concept here so this ner or named entity recognition is designed to enable computers to understand the meaning as well as the context of the words which is very important it will understand the context of the words in natural language text so in day to day life uh, people use this uh, nerrs in banking applications um uh, in organizations to identify a person uh and to categorize them based on their uh, previous history coming to the next application which i have listed here the text classification so it actually involves um, categorizing text documents into one or more predefined classes or categories based on their context alone so previously it was um, that is ner uh it is used for understanding the meaning and context of the words whereas here text classification actually um is used for categorizing the text based on the context so this particular nlp application enables computers to organize and make sense of large volume of text data available with us and the fourth one which is most interesting and more uh, research is going on in this field which we call it as sentiment analysis so you all know that there are uh, uh, what is it uh, text messages that conveys sentiments of people so actually this application sentiment analysis uh, involves automatically analyzing and classifying the sentiment of a text it will classify either as positive negative or neutral so this application enables the computers uh, to understand and interpret the emotions that's where it's it's a very interesting concept using text we have to understand the emotion and opinions expressed in natural language particularly uh, people use uh, the sentiment analysis uh, in twitter facebook and other social media platforms to see the reaction of people on certain uh, topics or on certain happenings of course the next application uh, which is on uh, your left is the question answering system 
So it actually involves generating answers to the questions. So we ask questions to the machine as in a natural language and the machine answers to it. So the last application, which is very, very important and uh, which has a lot of potential is the EHRs. So EHR stands for electronic health records and uh, uh, this EHRs actually contains vast amount of patient data, particularly um, it, it uh, contains like uh, the symptoms, the diagnosis, the treatments that are given to the patients, etc. So actually, uh, particularly in countries like USA and Australia, they have abundant EHR data available in unstructured text format. So this NLP, it used uh, the he electronic health records uh, to extract meaningful information out of the text that is available. And uh, they use this to predict or to identify patients with specific diseases or conditions just by giving the input data, the values. The machine will be in a position to identify certain diseases and it will suggest the treatment procedures that can be given to that patient based on the previous records that are available. So people use this EHRs also for drug interactions. Like for example, uh, if a drug is given to a particular patient, how that drug will interact over the patient's body and what will be the adverse effects that will be created so that it can be avoided. And uh, this EHR, of course, plays a major role in clinical decision making by providing doctors with uh, the relevant patient information in real time. So if you go for US uh, and Australia, they have a centralized database and all the patient records are stored. So the patient can just move over to any part, to any doctor and get treatment. There's no need for redundantly taking the tests and all. So this NLP has a vast potential to improve the quality of healthcare. And of course, it has n number of job opportunities, particularly for the NLP professionals, since a huge volume of text is available and a lot of work is to be done. n number of AI companies, I know a few of the companies in Chennai, they are operate on EHRs, they, would, they make a good amount of money over the EHRs. And, uh, you know, EHR uh, and another application where EHR is used is like uh, they use this for uh, the insurance sector also. The insurance sector also relies more on the EHR and uh, people, they settle the insurance amount in sir, real time nowadays. Sir, sorry to interrupt. We yes. are able to see only your title slides, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Till now it's not changing. Yes, sir. Yes, oh, sir. Man. I thought I had issues. Okay. okay. Now what about? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, ma'am. Yes. Yes, sir. It is visible. Thank you. Okay. Then I think full screen mode it's not uh, functioning. I'm yes, sorry. Sir. Okay. Uh, this is the previous slide. It talks about um, NLU and NLG, the two components of NLP. And this is the slide I was just explaining. The NLP applications like uh, uh, text mining, uh, NER, text classification, sentiment analysis, question answering, and EHRs. Okay. Maybe uh, uh, I'll just go with this mode instead of going for the uh, full screen mode. Now, with this introduction on NLP and its applications, we'll move on to the next part. What is quantum computing and uh, how quantum computing can help this NLP? See, this NLP actually requires a lot of processing capability. And uh, we now talk about CPUs and GPUs. Even this processing capability is not sufficient for NLP applications. We need more computing power and people talk about quantum computers. So this quantum computing uh, actually, uh, I can say that there are two words. One is quantum and another one is computing here. The word quantum originate from, of course, uh, the quantum mechanics of physics uh, part that is, it's a very basic theory in physics. So uh, I can say that the quantum here refers to the scale of atoms and molecule, molecules, the matter behaves in a quantum matter actually here. So this quantum computing is a new way of processing information. 
and of course there are n number of uh, quantum computers uh, available uh, it's not in the commercial stage but a few of the uh, leading uh, organizations have got their uh, quantum computing capabilities uh, installed in their premises and of course uh, they give they give access to researchers also on quantum computing particularly uh, companies like ibm so this quantum computing is a way of processing the information so uh, it uses quantum bits which we call it as qubits q u b i t s where you can see here so we are not using the classical bits 0 and 1 here instead we use uh, uh, qubits here so this is also a machine this quantum computer is a machine that performs calculations based on the law of quantum mechanics okay so uh, i'd like to know if anyone here knows about uh, quantum mechanics what are the laws of quantum mechanics Feel free. Don't worry. Even if you, uh, if you, you will be wrong or right. Uh, Professor, they were not introduced with quantum computing. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. yeah thank so, you. Uh, it's, uh, actually, we have like class of quantum uh, mechanics where uh, it says that uh, an electron. I think you are all very familiar with what's an electron, right? So the electron have the property of both a wave and a particle at the same time. This is the basic concept of quantum mechanics. Okay, so I'll repeat again. The electrons have the property of both a wave and a particle at the same time. So we call it as particle duality in short. Okay, so when we, find, when we try to uh, find the location of an electron, more precisely the less, we will be able to tell about the momentum of the particle okay this is the second law which is nothing but uncertainty principle and of course the third one is uh, cipher position so the cipher position actually is nothing but uh, i'm not taking much deeper into quantum computing i just wanted to tell like what is particle uh, duality what is uh, uncertainty principle what is uh, cipher position so these are the three uh, laws that governs this quantum computing or quantum mechanics so this cipher position actually is nothing but uh, it states that it is possible for an electron to be in multiple energy levels, which is very important. The electrons can be in multiple energy levels around an atom at the same time. We all know that uh, what about the atom, nucleus, the neurons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, I hope my slide is visible to all, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, professor. Okay, thank you. So these are the three basic uh, quantum law, laws. Uh, but but you can go in slideshow mode. Uh, okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am, it's fine now. No, not it. Now, ma'am. No. Okay, I don't know. Actually, it's in my full screen view. I'll stop sharing and share it again. Okay. Maybe I'll share the entire screen. Now I'll go for slide sharing. Uh, is it okay now? Yeah, now it's bad. It's okay. 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 Yeah. okay. So uh, these are the three basic laws that governs this quantum computers. Don't worry if you're not understanding, since ma'am told that we have not been introduced this, just for your understanding. OK, so uh, in this cipher position, we state that the electrons can be in multiple energy levels around an atom at the same time. And of course, uh, there's a thing called a subatomic level. Uh, a subatomic level, actually, uh, it refers to the level of matter that is smaller than the atoms itself. So in this level, that is at the subatomic level, uh, the particles such as uh, protons, electrons, neutrons, uh, they are studied and their behavior is described by the above three laws. Above in the sense I told like cyber position, uncertainty principle and the particle duality. So this is governed by this. Okay, so 
this quantum computer uh, i just wanted this like uh, uh, glass of quantum mechanics you can see in the blue color uh, bullet in the middle so it's just explaining those three laws of quantum mechanics uh, and of course the subatomic level here coming to the next point in this slide um, actually uh, maybe i can use a marker yeah so i was just explaining about this uh, subatomic uh, level to you here next coming to the another points uh, mentioned here uh, the quantum computers actually with, by using uh, the concept called as uh, qubits which is mentioned at the top it can perform calculations much faster than our ca classical computers which uses a cpu and a gpu uh, so examples for uh, calculations includes factoring large number or searching a very large uh, database etc so this quantum computers <coughs> will be very much helpful for us moving to the uh, next uh, slide of course um, history is integral part of everything so even uh, we might have started our uh, journey on computers by studying about the various uh, or the history of computers maybe from uh, abacus till uh, the latest machines which we use today so this is actually not a new concept uh, to be uh, very frank so actually the history starts something around uh, 1982 so when uh, Feynman actually is the man who proposed the idea of creating machines, particularly that can perform some calculations based on the three laws of quantum mechanics instead of using the laws of our classic physics, right? So he proposed this um, uh, far behind in 1982. So the um, actually this quantum mechanics. Uh, it's nothing but it's a branch of physics to be very precise it's a branch of physics uh, it describes uh, the behavior of matter and energy we all know that i just introduced we are talking about electrons its states its behavior etc so this quantum mechanics actually describes the behavior of matter and the energy here at two levels one is, or at two scales not levels two scales uh, one I can say that at the atomic level, another one at the subatomic scale or subatomic level. So, uh, actually, uh, after 1982, major uh, breakthrough was in, in 1985 when um, David Dutch actually developed the quantum Turing machine. So, I hope you are all very familiar with the uh, Turing machine, those who have studied the uh, finite automata etc may, may be very familiar with the uh, turing machine so turing machine actually is a finite automata machine which can perform certain calculations which are not able to be done by our push down automata or finite automata etc so uh, this david dutch actually he developed a quantum turing machine so um, this uh, quantum turing machine uh, actually had a circuit called as quantum circuits uh, which are universal in the sense these quantum circuits one developed once developed can be used for n number of other applications also okay and then in 1994 uh, peter shaw actually um, he produced another quantum algorithm uh, and that was used to factor very large numbers in polynomial time so this is a very important uh, breakthrough you know we are discussing about one application which we called it as NLP. So that NLP actually is a NP hard problem. If you just go and uh, uh, see text, it's it's an NP hard problem, and solving that problem requires more time. So this uh, quantum algorithm proposed by Peter actually it was for uh, finding the factor of very large numbers, and he used and he proved that it can be solved in polynomial time. Maybe you have to go for a little bit of data switches here. And then, of course, in 1997, uh, there was a major breakthrough when um, uh, Lon Drover uh, develops a quantum search algorithm. So this is another uh, interesting happening that happened uh, way back in 1997. And you can see the complexity of uh, that is uh, <coughs> for the algorithm proposed by uh, Drover. So now, maybe uh, before just talking about the latest happening uh, in 2001 uh, actually what happened was 
a seven qubit machine was uh, developed. It was built and programmed to run Shar's algorithm to successfully factor 15, which is another uh, important uh, breakthrough that happened in the history of quantum computing. Okay, this is history. What about today, where we stand? Today, actually, um, quantum computing focuses on overcoming the technical challenges. So technical challenges here refers to minimizing the errors that occurs during calculations and the scaling up the number of qubits. I told that the entire concept of this uh, quantum computing works on a concept called as qubits and the people are working in scaling up the number of qubits here and developing new algorithms and applications of course. People use the existing algorithms also but you can see that uh, this quantum circuits uh, which I am just pointing now plays a key role in all the applications and uh, once for an algorithm a quantum circuit is developed it can be used for any other application. So people uh, use this and uh, this quantum computing or uh, this quantum computers uh, uh, is rapidly advancing and uh, it has a great potential to revolutionize uh, particularly fields like uh, material science of course people talk about materials now whenever we talk about uh, electric vehicles they talk about lithium ion etc material sciences plays a key role and uh, this quantum computing will be revolutionizing that material uh, sciences and of course cryptography uh, coming to our domain uh, cyber security is uh, 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 a promising area since a number of uh, uh, cyber attacks happen every day new types of attacks are uh, being uh, tried out so to minimize all those things uh, we can develop a number of good algorithms uh, uh, for uh, cyber security as well as for uh, cryptography for secure uh, data transmission and uh, the other area where quantum computing will be playing a major role is drug discovery of course, you might have studied about uh, COVID vaccination, etc. With this limited capability of classical computing, we were able to get the breakthrough in few months. Uh, when I was just going through about uh, the previous pandemics that struck this world, uh, I read that for uh, uh, coming out of a vaccination, uh, it took some seven years. Just think about the COVID and uh, we take seven years to develop a vaccine for that. Uh, we cannot just imagine what will be the effects of it, right? So normal computers, they play a key role in drug discovery. And of course, quantum computing will revolutionize this domain, particularly drug discovery. So these are some of the fields actually. So now, what is this qubit? I was using a word called as uh, qubit. So it's not the same classic bit. So here is a diagrammatic representation of what this uh, qubit actually uh, refers to. Uh, you can see the classic bits, zeros and ones. Maybe we use it in our classical uh, computers and you can see a qubit on the screen now. So um, this qubit is actually the basic unit of quantum information. Okay, so uh, here uh, you can see the diagrammatic representation. I'll just explain what it means. So uh, it is a two level quantum system. That's very important. Uh, so we, these two levels can be superimposed or we have a superimposition of these two states. So one qubit, what we can do is we can entangle them with another uh, qubit, which means that the state becomes correlated uh, to the other in a way that uh, cannot be described using ca classical physics here. Okay, so unlike this classical bits which has got uh, 0 and 1, uh, as I told you, this uh, qubits can be entangled with uh, another qubit, uh, which means that the states can be correlated uh, with each other. So this qubits, how to realize it in a physical manner. See, for example, this zero and ones, we say that uh, whenever a switch is on, I can say that, uh, or whenever a circuit goes up, we can say that it is a one, and uh, when it is open, we say that it is a zero. But how to realize this qubit? So there are different systems to 
uh, what is it, realize these qubits, we can use atoms, ions, uh, superconducting circuits, or uh, photonics to realize this thing physically. Okay. Uh, nowadays, what people are doing is uh, they are using the superconducting circuits or superconducting qubits. Uh, which is more uh, promising, uh, the most promising, I can say that it's not more, most promising candidate for uh, uh, building very large scale uh, quantum computers. Okay, so here the same zeros and one are there, but we have a, a different representation here, like uh, uh, you can see the, it's a very simple mathematical formula. Okay, so generally a qubit is represented by uh, a vertical line, the value followed by uh, the uh, gradient symbol. Okay, so now uh, there, are, as I told you, how we can realize or how we can generate this qubits. There are n number of ways to generate qubits, uh, but as I told you, one method is by using this uh, superconducting uh, systems. Okay, so what is the superconducting and what it actually uh, does this is just a diagrammatical representation see i'm not uh, going in depth uh, technically since i just wanted as i told you at the start i want to give you a bird's eye view of what is nlp what is uh, quantum computing and of course what is quantum nlp with some uh, existing tools so this particular slide which is in picture uh, shows how we can generate qubits uh, so this uh, superconducting qubits, uh, they are nothing but artificial atoms, okay? Let's be very clear, if they are artificial atoms. So they exist in a quantum superposition between two states uh, and uh, they can be used to perform quantum computations. Okay, so here you can see there are some uh, five uh, things. One is initialization, second one is manipulation, readout, decoherence and scaling up. So let me just uh, explain one by one. First one is initialization. So let me just go back again here coming to this uh, superconducting qubits. They are nothing but artificial atoms. Just no acid. Uh, just have this information. Coming to this initialization, um, here what we do is this is uh, the first step in performing uh, quantum computation by using this uh, superconducting qubits. So here, uh, the ground state or an equal superposition of the ground or excited states, sorry, ground and excited states are used here uh, to initialize this artificial atoms. Once it is done, once the qubits are initialized, which means the artificial atoms are initialized, they can be manipulated by so how that manipulation is done, we use microwave pulses to manipulate those artificial atoms which are already initialized. Or we can go for control signals uh, which can be used for manipulations. So the control signals actually uh, can be used to implement quantum gates. I think you might have, uh, uh, you are very familiar with this word gate. Am I right? In electronic circuits, you might have studied about uh, AND gate, OR gate, NAND, etc., universal gate, etc. So, coming to this artificial uh, atoms, manipulating by using signals, we can implement quantum gates. So, this quantum gates will be the basic building blocks for quantum circuits. So, once the uh, manipulation is done, we will be getting some uh quantum gates using which we can build our quantum circuit so this as i told you quantum circuits are universal so once it is built we can be we can use it for a number of applications the third one is readout so once uh, the manipulation is done that is the gates are done they are measured to obtain the output the uh, the output in the form of classical output so we use microwaves or some electromagnetic signals to read out the output generated by those gates. So once that uh, that is read, we go for the concept called as decoherence. So this is the major challenge or the key challenge in uh, using the superconducting qubits. So the decoherence actually occurs when qubits 
are entangled with their environment, causing their quantum states to collapse into a classic state. There are two states. One is the quantum state. Another one is the classic states. So this decoherence actually uh, occurs when the qubits are entangled with their environment and they cause the quantum state to collapse, in, collapse into a normal classic state. So to avoid this, uh, to, uh, what researchers are doing is they carefully engineer the superconducting circuits when, whenever that manipulation is done and the surrounding environment to minimize the effects of noise and other sources of inference cost. And of course, the last one is uh, scaling up. So scaling up, as you know, we know that we have heard about the word scalability. Here, the scaling up almost refers to the same meaning here. They are used to build uh, practical quantum computers. So they are used for uh, scaling up the number of qubits and the complexity of the circuits that are being developed. So the superconducting qubits are uh, the leading candidates for building large scale quantum computers that we use today. The main advantage of using this superconducting qubits is that they are easily scalable and of course, it has got very less error rates. Okay, so don't worry if you are not understanding about this much since it's a maybe a, a different course in itself which requires some 40 or 50 hours to understand. Now, by uh, introducing you to what is NLP, what are the applications, what is quantum computing and how a quantum gate is uh, developed by using this uh, uh, superconducting uh, concept. Now we go for how quantum computing can help with NLP, which is very important. So QNLP or quantum NLP. Uh, it's an emerging field uh, in AI particularly. It, com uh, it actually uh, combines the principle of quantum computing with natural language processing. Okay, why quantum NLP? Actually, there are n number of limitations uh, of the current NLP, which I can call it as classical NLP. Uh, the main limitation is that it is not able to handle large amount of data. Uh, see, text data available will be in huge volume and uh, this classic NLP or classical NLP, uh, it finds very difficult to handle such uh, data. And of course, uh, uh, performing uh, certain uh, language processing tasks is a challenge, still a challenge in this classical NLP. And hence, researchers starting looking at started looking at quantum computing whether it can help nlp of course people are trying to do that and they have found that quantum computing will be of great interest and help for the nlp fraternity so uh, particularly this classic nlp uh, struggles with certain concepts like uh, sentiment analysis speech recognition uh, still, see, uh, we use speech recognition everywhere. Our mobile phones has got speech recognition uh, algorithms. Uh, our, uh, of course, our TV remotes also has got that. Our uh, autonomous vehicles have got, uh, what is it, speech recognition systems. But still, they lag certain things. Still, it has got a number of uh, uh, errors uh, which uh, people have to uh, address. Okay. So, uh, actually, coming to this, uh, how quantum computing will help NLP, the first point uh, mentioned here is like speeding up the computation, as I told you, like sentiment analysis and uh, speech recognition, it involves a lot of uh, computational capability, which the quantum computing can provide to us. The next one is like, uh, improved uh, machine learning. Of course, uh, machine learning plays a key role in uh, most of the NLP applications and uh, uh, the use of NLP can see, uh, it can, uh, I can put like, I can provide uh, significant advantages over uh, NLP in terms of uh, speed and accuracy of the algorithms, which of course uh, is need of the R. And uh, it also, in, it will, that is quantum computing will enhance the search capabilities 
since searching is very vital uh, uh, for uh, bringing out useful information from the voluminous data that are available. So uh, it will be very much helpful for that. And of course, this quantum NLP can uh, potentially lead to new approaches of language processing. So it will it may be in the form of like quantum based models for information retrieval uh, and natural language understanding, of course. So uh, we can see a significant advancements in quantum NLP that uh, that will lead to new breakthroughs uh, the way we understand and analyze natural language. And of course, uh, uh, we can say that uh, I can say that quantum computing will be an enabler. Uh, that will help the NLP community to uh, develop algorithms. <coughs> sorry, develop algorithms that can work faster and more efficient. Uh, of course, processing huge volume of uh, data. So, speeding up computation is uh, one among the thing. Of course, improved machine learning, and uh, the third one, as uh, as mentioned here, uh, enhancing the search capabilities. So. Quantum computing actually can help improve the accuracy and uh, efficiency of search algorithms. Uh, particularly, it will be useful for tasks such as uh, document retrieval, question answering systems like a bot, etc. And the last help that quantum computing can provide to NLP is in terms of uh, encryption. So here I have mentioned like breaking encryption. So uh, actually, this is not uh, was a positive way to use, right? Uh, since encryption people do for uh, transmitting data in a more secure manner and breaking an encryption by using quantum computing, of course, uh, will have its own uh, challenges to the legal uh, fraternity. Okay, that's a, a second story. So this is not a positive use case, of course, uh, but uh, I feel that it's worth mentioning here that quantum computing can potentially break some of the encryption methods that we use to secure language data today. Uh, but, but of course, this could be a significant challenge for the NLP applications that rely on secure communication, as I told you. But it will be helpful for the government to uh, decrypt certain data by using this quantum encryption. And, uh, many algorithms and many uh, very good research are actually going on in this quantum uh, cryptography. Even one of my colleague, uh, is working in quantum cryptography and uh, he has come up with uh, very good algorithms that can uh, change the way uh, encryption are uh, broken down. Okay, now uh, this particular slide has explained to you about uh, what is, uh, uh, sorry, how quantum computing can aid NLP in terms of speeding up communication, improving the algorithm enhancing the search capability, breaking encryption, etc. Now, uh, let me just move on to the next slide where I just wanted to project some applications of uh, quantum NLP. The same applications, whatever I have mentioned earlier for NLP applies well here. We can use it for sentiment analysis. We can use it for text summarization. We can use it for question and answering session. We can use it for speech recognition, information retrieval, language translation, etc. So this QNLP actually um, it's a field that explores the intersection of quantum computing and NLP. That's very interesting. So it aims to apply the principles and algorithms of quantum computing to improve the efficiency and accuracy. Of course, I just mentioned it earlier of uh, whatever NLP tasks we are going to uh, perform. So I don't want to explain what is the sentiment analysis again, what is text summarization, question answering, etc. again and again. But uh, let me just tell you how or uh, this quantum NLP will help sentiment analysis, etc. I'm not going to detail about what is sentiment analysis. So uh, as I told you, it is for uh, getting the emotion out of the text and all. So this quantum NLP may be uh, it will process the nuances of the language and sentiment analysis uh, in a far more efficient and accurate way than the classical NLP technique actually works. Similarly, of course, translation uh, 
language translation is another key and you might have seen like uh, uh, particularly google at all translating our uh, language into english or uh, from english to our language sometimes it's more funny but uh, on using this quantum computing uh, maybe we will achieve a breakthrough and the translation will be on par with uh, human translation uh, particularly from one human language to another human spoken languages coming to the tech summarization part actually uh, uh, you know i told like uh, there are two types of summarization extractive and abstractive summarization so this quantum nlp based tech summarization uh, will be providing us ample opportunity to process large amount of generate uh, what is it uh, large amount of data and um, we can generate more accurate and concise summaries that's very important accurate and concise uh, summaries can be generated by using this quantum nlp based text summarization and of course question answering like a bot etc uh, it will be very much uh, accurate coming to speech recognition see uh, nowadays uh, most of our voice to uh, uh, what is it? Uh, voice search and uh, voice to text uh, conversation between us and the systems are not so much accurate. But uh, since uh, each and every language will have their nuances, quantum NLP will be helping us to overcome that particular barrier. And it will be like a human being talking with not another human being in a natural way instead of us trying to communicate with a machine. It will become so seamless that uh, we may not be identifying whether we are talking with a human being or a machine as Turing just thought before some 50 or 50 or 60 years. And uh, let me just move on to the next slide. Uh, I just wanted to introduce to you uh, certain libraries uh, that are available and certain frameworks that are um, available for um, uh, QNLP. So uh, actually I have given in my uh, presentation uh, the paper and uh, it's na named as uh, lambic an efficient high level python library for uh, quantum nlp so uh, actually this is a open source toolkit you can see that uh, in the slide i have mentioned that it's a uh, uh, open source uh, toolkit that's available anyone can make use of this uh, lambic uh, as we are using any other uh, python library so uh, here uh, you can see the pipeline that has been implemented by this lambda here. So it involves parsing, encoding, rewriting, parameterization, of course, optimi and at the end we have the optimization of uh, thing. So uh, actually you can see the part here, quantum circuit or tensor net uh, in this part, right? So until that uh, normal classical energy will be doing there. So, this uh, Lambda actually uh, uh, helps in performing uh, <clears throat> what is it uh, most of the NLP related tasks. So um, uh, the first quantum uh, machines, uh, which we they call it as the NISQ. Uh, NISQ stands for uh, Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum Computers. So this actually allows us to go for QNLP by training the model and uh, run simple NLP experiments on the quantum hardware. Okay, quantum hardware, as of now, they are very much costlier. They are available in very few research institutions only. Uh, so the nearest institution in Chennai, IITM uh, physics department, I think uh, one uh, Dr. Prabha is there. She's doing a very good work in, in association with IBM related to this quantum computing, not on quantum NLP, general quantum quantum computing. So this is for your uh, information. So if anyone are interested, maybe you can uh, try out uh, working with her. She's from the physics department of IITM. So uh, coming to our uh, presentation, I'm sorry, I just deviated a bit. Um, uh, what is it? This particular quantum library will be uh, of uh, great use for you to have a hands on experience uh, with uh, the QNLP uh, models. So, this library allows the conversion of uh, any sentence to a quantum circuit. You can see that I just don't read of any sentence, it will change it to a quantum circuit uh, based on the model that we are proposing and the parameters which we are uh, giving. Okay, uh, 
so it is based on some mathematical assumptions actually and the pipeline gives you a just overview of that so uh, this lambic actually is extensible and uh, it can accommodate any composition and model that can encode uh, sentences uh, it is a native data structure actually that's very important um, and um, I just wanted to list out few of the companies that have invested in quantum computing. As I told you, uh, this is really a very costly affair as a date, uh, just as computers maybe in their uh, early days of uh, introduction. So commercially, they are not out in the market, but uh, companies like IBM, uh, they have started way back in 1990. Uh, they are using that superconducting technology they are doing it uh, with uh, MIT and there's a company uh, called as D-Wave which started in 1999 and they also use uh, superconducting and uh, quantum annealer and of course Microsoft uh, they are actually doing a wonderful job they started a bit late to, to 2005 they started <clears throat> they have uh, their own uh, tools like uh, Q sharp just like C sharp they have Q sharp uh, sorry Q sharp uh, actually, uh, the next company, Hitachi, they started their uh, yeah, initiation in 2012. They use the silicon CMOS technology here. They are associated with certain universities, which you can see here. And of course, 2013, uh, Google also came into picture. They called it as QAIL. Okay, so uh, these are companies that are invested and working in quantum computing, uh, not QNLP alone. In general, they are work on quantum computing. So NLP may be an application for them. So next thing, OK, so I just described about what is NLP, what is quantum computing, and a bit of QNLP techniques, etc., etc. But how to make use of this? Like practically, how a student or a faculty can make use of that to develop some algorithms or to develop some circuits? So next slide, actually, this provides you uh, <clears throat> with some interesting, uh, what is it, the tools that you can make use to work on quantum machine learning algorithms. So uh, IBM, as I told you, has got its own open source software development kit. We know that SDKs, right? Known as FISKIT, Q-I-S-K-I-T. This FISKIT. It's, as I told you, a open source software uh, development kit. Uh, we can work with quantum computer at the level of circuits and algorithms in this. Okay. So this biscuit actually provides tools for creating and uh, manipulating quantum programs. And we can run them on prototype quantum devices on IBM quantum simulator. Okay. On our local machine itself. We, we, we can uh, run that. And coming to the another side, we have uh, Microsoft. They have their QDK, Quantum Development Kit. Just like uh, this kit, they have QDK. So uh, it is the uh, software development kit required to interface with Azure Quantum Services. They use it with uh, the cloud computing platform, uh, which includes uh, quantum programming uh, language called as QSharp. I just mentioned there in the slide. Um, another interesting thing is that this QDK actually supports Quiskit, uh, sorry, Quiskit of uh, IBM also. Uh, so we can use uh, Quiskit or Q Sharp in Microsoft uh, QDK to run few applications. And coming to this uh, Q Sharp, like C Sharp, uh, we have heard about C++ and then C Sharp, uh, etc. So this Q Sharp is an open source high level programming language and uh, the particular thing is that we use it for developing and running quantum algorithms okay so uh, we can also use python c sharp f sharp uh, and other normal uh, languages that uh, you are uh, familiar with in this uh, qdk uh, this qdk actually supports uh, procedural model of writing uh, programs we can use uh, uh, loops, branching statements, for example, if, uh, then, and the common data types, everything we can use in this uh, QDK. So these are the two interesting and very simple tools. They are self-learning uh, tools. Anyone can make use, make use of this. Only thing is that you should have some basic programming skill. That's all. Okay. 
Now let me just move on to a concept. I just wanted to explain one or two concepts, but I just give a bird's eye view of uh, one variational quantum classifier. Okay, so we can call it as uh, VQC in uh, short. Uh, I think you you might be familiar with what is a classifier, right? Uh, can someone tell me what is a classifier? Just to uh, assign a class label. Okay. So there are uh, two major techniques. One is a classific classifier, another one is uh, cluster or clustering, classification and clustering. So if the data has got some class labels, we can easily classify them into groups. For example, maybe a class may be having a set of boys and girls. Uh, or we can say like classify like uh, students in their uh, first year, second year, third year, final year, etc. So we can group them based on class labels. We call it as classifier. Uh, if class labels are not present in the data, then we go for uh, clustering where the system will take some random data and it will try to form some clusters. So here is an example for uh, a concept called as uh, VQC, Variational Quantum Classifier. Uh, so, actually, in this, what they do is uh, uh, they have a feature map. They load the data into the quantum system. And as I told you, they have to produce a circuit where, which they call it as the variational circuit here. So, this variation circuit will act as the quantum classification circuit. Once it is done, they go for assigning a binary label since labeling is very important. And afterwards, they go for uh, the classical uh, <coughs> optimization loop, which tries to uh, do the data. So uh, generally, we were uh, myself and some of my uh, undergraduate students are doing a work on uh, this uh, quantum NLP in particular. They are working for the past three months. So what we have done in our research is like uh, we try to experiment with the capabilities of this quantum computing for uh, NLP. Uh, like uh, we have a number of neural networks, classical neural networks, maybe like RNN, CNN, and of course LSTM is there. So they work exceptionally well. There's no second thought as on date, they perform exceptionally well for text data. But uh, the thing is that uh, these neural networks uh, uh, if I want to improve the performance of this, it requires a lot of data to train them. So we try to combine uh, the classical uh, machine learning algorithms with that of quantum uh, computing. Uh, we were trying or we try to reduce the amount of uh, data needed to train the systems. So this was the core idea behind our uh, research. Actually, we found it. Uh, I found, found this uh, problem statement from one of the uh, literatures we were uh, studying. So uh, from that only we came to this idea of VQC variational quantum uh, classifier. So actually, this VQC is a combination of two things. Uh, one is a classical neural networks with uh, quantum machine learning classifier. So it's a two thing, not a single one. Uh, here, uh, training is done uh, for the classical LSTM. Uh, I think you all know what is an LSTM. So we go for uh, uh, training a classical LSTM neural network uh, and we extract the features required for quantum training. So we go for quantum training here. So we extracted uh, the trained features for the last before layer. That's quite interesting for from the LSTM, the last before la la layer, we extracted the trained features uh, along with the uh, white train label here. And then we split the extracted features into X train, X test, Y train and Y test. And it is passed on to the quantum classifier. So uh, we fixed uh, some hyperparameters um, like uh, feature map, optimizers, measurement, and uh, some measurement functions. So it is quite interesting, but still uh, it's going on. Uh, here is a, uh, uh, a circuit uh, which explains about what is a feature map, where, what is a variation circuit, etc. that's used. Um, uh, actually, this VQC algorithm has uh, some training stages and all. 
So uh, here we use uh, n bit uh, classification string, which is obtained uh, once we measure the variational quantum circuit using the measurement operator. Uh, we use a very simple Boolean function here for this, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, measurement uh, for, for uh, sending a binary label here, since labeling is very much important. And then finally, of course, the classical optimization uh, uh, loop is uh, present. So we go for linear approximation optimizer, or we can go for uh, stochastic approximation optimizer, uh, et cetera, which we are trying out. We are not at, uh, gone to this part term. So uh, maybe I'll just conclude here. Uh, I have to say my special thanks to my uh, students who are um, really motivated, uh, what is it, uh, working with me on this uh, particular project. We are still working with QMP based uh, classifier. So I have to thank uh, Sindhu, uh, Vivek, Jay Prakash, Ganesh, and uh, Hashmita for this wonderful work. Uh, maybe I think it's time for me to stop sharing my PPD as well as my voice. Now it's your turn. If you have some questions, I'm very much happy to answer you. Yeah. Any questions from you? Uh, sir, thank yes, you for sir. the session, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, I just have a doubt. Sir. So we have seen lots of advantages about using NLP. Uh, what about the issues that we need to keep in mind? Issues in the sense like... Uh, 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 sir, like it, is there any drawbacks and how to overcome it? Yeah, first of all, uh, no commercial hardware is available, point, point number one. You have to still rely upon uh, uh, companies like uh, IBM, etc., Google, etc. Uh, actually, uh, conventional computers, even though they have their, what is it, less computational power, they are uh, freely available for any one of the uh, scientists to work upon. Whereas uh, that's still a major uh, uh, yardstick, which people are working to make it commercialized so that it is available to most of the people. Uh, see, for example, uh, it requires some crores of money to uh, uh, create an infrastructure for a quantum thing. Maybe <laughs> in one among the articles that I studied, uh, they have said that some 80 crores are required for creating the infrastructure and facilitate research, uh, basic research. So it's more, more costlier. This is only for the basic thing, but uh, still, if you want uh, higher things, money may just uh, shoot up. This is one among the drawbacks which you have to consider. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so funding is a major problem here. Okay, sir. Uh, text corpus in the NLP. Yeah, it's a, actually a text corpus, uh, uh, we can say like, uh, it is nothing but the data that we are going to use or we give to the uh, machine. Okay, so uh, there are, the number of texts available, maybe I can say that uh, uh, plain text. So plain text uh, may be useful for certain applications. Uh, generally, this corpus or corpora, uh, maybe we can call it as, uh, we have n number of corpora available in certain languages, uh, which is the base or the data which is initially given to an NLP for uh, using that. So it has its own... Uh, uh, what is it, uh, traits, like uh, which, see, for example, you all know that uh, uh, whatever input we give will be the output, right? Uh, garbage in, garbage out. Similarly, if we have a good corpus, then your NLP will be producing very good uh, output. So we should have, like, uh, <coughs> uh, it should have very good number of words and um, Outdated text uh, data will not be providing a sufficient thing. And of course, if metadata is present, you all know about or metadata. Maybe in DBMS, you might have studied. Uh, we study like data about data, etc. So uh, this metadata should indicate the sources of uh, the text so that uh, the machine can understand the context also. 
Uh, next one is the size of the carpus. It will be of uh, great help so that uh, it will uh, help us to get good output. And uh, as I told you, if I go for unsupervised uh, training models, uh, a plain text carpus is very good. Uh, if I want to go for some supervised training, then we need a uh, plain text uh, with annotations. Annotations here means uh, uh, like it will be giving some information about the uh, data. And uh, Carpus actually, uh, what we can or what I can say that uh, the text is collected not only from a single source, but it is collected from a variety of sources. For example, I want to talk something about cricket, particularly the recent matches. So uh, to the machine, I'll be giving input uh, not only from, for example, um, I think as of my knowledge, uh, there is a paper or a magazine called a Sports Star. We have uh, in all the newspapers like the Hindu Times of India, Indian Express, etc. They have a sports column. So all these related to cricket will be taken and it will be assembled here. So a variety of sources will be taken and from blogs, of course, uh, and from Twitter and from Facebook posts, etc. It will be taken and it will be assembled. And at this uh, data or the carpus selected from various sources can be used for NLP tasks. Okay, any other questions, uh, Mohan? And uh, when I talk about this uh, annotation, particularly I told uh, data is to be annotated for supervised uh, training models. Uh, the POS, I think you are all very familiar with uh, POS, like parts of speech is uh, one among the most annotations that we use in NLP. Thank you, Mohan. Thank you, sir. No duty is more urgent than the top returning thanks. Yeah, it's time to give vote of thanks. On behalf of Department of Computer Science Engineering, SVC, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to our eminent guest, our alumni, Dr. R. Prasanna Kumar, Associate Professor, Computer Science Department, Amrita University, Chennai. Being an alumni, you have not only focused on self-growth, you have also departing knowledge to help your juniors by get updated with the current knowledge. Even after your graduation, you are still proving your excellence in delivering the knowledge. With your progress, you made this day more proudful. Thank you for playing such an inspirational role for your peers. Next, my sincere thanks to the head of the department who provided us with unwavering support during the session. A wide round of applause and thanks to all the participants who made the event memorable one. Guys, without you all, the day will not be complete. Finally, I would like to thank all of you present here for making this day event a success. Thank you one and all. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all for your patient uh, listening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor. It was a wonderful uh, uh, talk that you have given. And uh, we have taken more information uh, from your end. So it's, it's my good pleasure. to know that uh, NLP applications has been executed in quantum computing. Is there any live projects going on, Professor? Yes, ma'am. Actually, myself and some of my students are doing a classifier-based project. And uh, of course, we have a tie-up with one uh, Chennai-based uh, AI firm. It's not Chennai-based. Uh, they are in Chennai, but they are headquartered in, uh, I think, New York. So uh, we are working with them on some electronic health record-based uh, uh, projects. Okay. How do you set up the quantum environment? Uh, yes, ma'am. Actually, we are uh, using these qubits and uh, we got the input, uh, like we, uh, we have access to an IBM uh, quantum machine now. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, is your institute tie up with uh, IBM to make use of their facility or uh, you have made use of the simulation that is released? Uh, actually, we have not uh, any, for we don't have any formal agreement with uh, IBM, but uh, through informal uh, ways, uh, like one-to-one uh, -one contact, we are doing that. That's wonderful, uh, Professor. So Thank you are you an ma alumni of SCC. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, that's great to hear from you. Yeah. So uh, I belong to the 96-2000 batch. Uh, oh. Okay, fine. That's great. So I thought you worked in SCC. Someone was telling me 
no so it's great to hear that you are a part of uh, uh, alumni Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's my pleasure to address my uh, alma mater. Yeah, yeah, sure. Stay in touch, uh, Professor. Sure, ma'am. I thought of coming and uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, please. You are welcome. Uh, come to the uh, college. No, meet the students. I think uh, the information uh, sharing should happen between the alumni and the current student. Yes, ma'am. Because sir. SPC uh, is doing best because of its alumni. Yes, ma'am. Actually, we thought of coming for the 20th year in 2020, but you know, okay. uh, yeah. all our plans were uh, what is it? Oh, okay. COVID. By that, uh, COVID. Yeah. We are okay. planning for the 25th year. In another two years, maybe we will be. Yeah, sir. Before that, back. I think you could establish a good connection with our department too. Yes, ma'am. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much yeah, for being here. Stay, stay connected. Yeah, sure. And uh, thanks to Gurija ma'am also. Thank you so much. Uh, with all your thank permission. You, yeah, Gurija? Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, President Kumar, Thank sir. you so much, sir. Uh, it's my pleasure, ma'am. It's my pleasure to address. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, one you. small request, actually. Uh, yeah, if I can get the feedback from the students. Uh, some mm. Back. Mm. It will be very much uh, helpful for me to improvise uh, my future. Yeah, yeah, definitely we'll be sharing the feedback. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Uh, sure, sir, at the end of the at the end of the FTP program, we will uh, share the uh, feedback form, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, we will uh, send you the same to you. To yeah, your mail. One request is: Could you share the uh, objective of today's workshop and the outcome to be measured? So that we can get a proper feedback from the students whether yeah, they yeah. have a sure, sure. I'll do that. I'll do that. Yeah. I'll just frame yeah. some questions and I'll say. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank yes. you all. Welcome. Thank you, coordinators. We'll meet tomorrow. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all. Thank you all.